What's up? <laughs> <laughs> we do a rolling start, so you know. Um, yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Um, thank you for for coming on. I, I, you're a busy woman. I mean, <laughs> judging by all your activity, and and we'll talk about that. But uh, yeah, introduce yourself to everybody. Yeah. So really happy to be here. My name is Constanza Eliana Chinea. Uh, I am from Borinquen, otherwise known by its colonial name as Puerto Rico. And uh, I am an activist, I'm a speaker, I'm an educator. Uh, pretty soon I'll be adding an extra label to there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both know about, but um, yeah, I just, I do a lot of anti-racist and decolonial education online, uh, both on my Instagram and my Patreon. So yeah, that's what I do. How did you, how did you get into that? I mean, cause I saw that on your uh, YouTube and which was helpful too, cause I, I have terrible back <laughs> and uh you know my hips are tight and all that stuff yeah. so i looked at your morning routine thing and i started doing it outside um <laughs> so that's how you kind of is that how you kind of started making content and then how did you i mean you tell you tell the story yeah so i was in the uh in the yoga industry for a really long time for about 11 years and uh, I still consider myself to be a part of the wellness industry, but I've kind of moved away from the yoga side of things um, as I have, you know, been attempting to reclaim my own indigenous culture and practices. So um, how I really got into the anti-racist and decolonial side of things uh, was actually through all of the experiences that I was having in the yoga industry. Um, I was having very racialized experiences, very prejudiced experiences. Um, a lot of people know that the yoga industry is pretty much a white dominated industry in the West. So as you can imagine, which is weird, right? Cause like, I mean, yoga comes from India and it's not, it's Eastern, you know? Right. Yeah. It's an Eastern spiritual practice. So when it came to the West, I think because whiteness kind of overtook it, um, it has become a very white centric and white supremacist, um, you know, centered space. And uh, as a very visibly brown Latina woman, I was experiencing a lot of racism and prejudice, even within this, you know, toxic positive space. Um, and so I found it to be a really difficult and traumatizing thing. And I started talking to my peers of color, which there's not a lot of teachers of color, uh, surprisingly enough, but the, the ones that I did find in my local area I was sharing a lot of these experiences and what I found was that um, so many of us were um, almost gaslighting ourselves like we we didn't want to believe that uh, a lot of these experiences were racialized we wanted to kind of excuse them away as just ignorant behavior. Um, some of some people actually did consider them to be racialized and so I found it to be a very conflicting space and. Um, for me, just uh, having a very activist spirit since I was very young, I started off in animal rights and liberation activism. I, you know, was wanting to merge a lot of social justice, um, you know, narratives into my teaching, but I was being told that that was going to drive people away, that I couldn't do that. And I, I found it to be very conflicting. I think social justice needs to be a part of healing circles and it needs to be a part of uh, the wellness space. Um, otherwise, you're just ignoring a very real trauma that people of color face every single day. So Which is great. I mean, because like that's what most people who black and brown people, especially inner city, when we saw all those, you're from yeah. LA, you're out in LA. When we see all those yoga yoga people out on the beach or whatever, they're mm -hmm. like, we think that they're so detached from what's going on in the real world, right? Like, right. They're talking about peace and love, and yet they're you know a lot of them are racist. <laughs> you know, like. Very, yeah, very. And um, they will deny it, you know, f like feverishly deny that that racism and prejudice exists within that world. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was a very surreal experience. And so I started taking anti racist courses just so I could get familiar with the language of how to speak to my experience. Um, all I could say was, you know, I think this is racist or I think this is xenophobia. I didn't really have the language and the terminology um, to be able to speak something to something much clear, more clearly. Um, and so I started taking anti-racism courses. I started getting back into social justice activism. Where, did, where do you, where does one go about taking anti-racist uh, courses? <laughs> 
Do you, yes. do, you do, is it like a, a mail-in catalog or something? <laughs> no, I mean, you actively have to seek it out. I think the great thing about social media, although it has a lot of pitfalls, um, is that you're able to like really find people who kind of are doing the things that you're interested in and the things that you want to be searching for. So uh, just through the yoga community, I was able to find a, um, a, a few courses that were being taught particularly to yoga teachers. Um, and then through those courses, I, I found myself having a lot of conversations with my own students and also with the greater yoga community in general. And then I decided to start, you know, kind of teaching on my own because there are so few anti-racist teachers in the wellness space in particular, or at least that there weren't a lot when I first started about four years ago. And, um, and then through anti-racist um, theory, I actually found that there was a little bit of a disconnect between anti-racism and decolonial theory. So both of them are very particular and very specific um, in their own way, but they do actually balance each other out. And what I was noticing is that they were being taught separately and I wanted to kind of merge the two together because I felt that was important and particularly decolonial theory because I am Boricua, we are a colonized territory. It is actually really personal to me that people learn about decolonization. And so um, I started taking, you know, decolonial courses. Uh, I found a mentor. We'll, I ta we'll talk about the course. distinction, you know, because a lot of people, you know, especially a lot of my audience, you know, I, I, I like the idea that I'm talking to people who, you know, maybe, are just like normal people, you know, like we're, yeah. we're kind of enlightened, right? <laughs> but like, uh, you know, when you start talking about words, like you start throwing out words like deco deco decolonization, you know, people yeah. get scared off and they probably know what it is, but they just don't haven't heard about it. They don't know what it is. So, you know, what is the difference between anti-racist and deco decolonization? Yeah, so anti-racism essentially is the study of race and systemic racism. So how do the two kind of uh, work together? Um, it really is about dismantling white supremacist culture and ideology and how it plays out in your daily you know, existence, right? So it, it plays out both systemically, socially, and interpersonally, meaning your, your personal relationships with people. Um, on the decolonial side, it kind of takes it one step further where we're not just talking about race. It's not just like critical race theory, um, but it actually touches on the systemic behavior of colonization. So imperialism, colonization, capitalism is also a part of that. Racism comes into play, but also um, sexism and gender and all of those things. How do they relate to each other and how does it negatively affect people? So. I think a lot of people think of colonization as strictly a government overtaking another and kind of imposing its views onto that population. And that is true, that does happen right. um, very viscerally and very violently. However, um, colonization is also a mentality and that is actually more prevalent than a government kind of taking over another country or people in general. So I kind of aim to, um, have decolonization or decolonial theory with a foundation of anti-racist theory um, so that it becomes much more holistic to talk about and it becomes a lot easier to dismantle it because i'm not just talking about colonization but i'm also talking about how systemic racism feeds colonization um, so I, I try to merge the two together do, do me a favor real quick, uh, move your screen up because you're kind of cutting the top of your head off and I want oh, to get your full <laughs> beautiful face. Let me actually move it back a little. There you go. Okay, hopefully that's better. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, the 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 anti-racist, uh, I mean, I'm anti-racist. I mean, you you if you're black, you have to be anti-racist because you or else you're 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 keeping yourself back right you're keeping your you're uh, participating in your own oppression as they say right mm, yeah um but i was just talking the other day about i did this you know i know we're not supposed to talk about latino rebels ah julio forgive me but i you know i did a piece on uh, colorism in latino um within the latino communities yeah and uh people were so mad they were like duh this is this is a this is a you know uh old news whatever but I felt like they were saying that because they didn't want to be reminded of it. Like, 
Yeah. I, was, I said the other day in another thing that Latinos like to think of racism as white against Latino. Racist, Latino isn't a race, first of all, but they like to think that white versus Latino or mm -hmm. white versus black. They don't like to think racism within Latino society, culture, whatever. Right. And uh, the other thing I was thinking, you know, and um, just in the context of racism in general, like, is racism going to be here for a racism going to be with us for a long time? I love the idea that race anti racists have like it's almost like millennial. It's almost like millennial small m, where like any <laughs> minute now it's going to end, right? Racism's going to end. Jesus is coming any minute, like a thief in the night, right? <laughs> um, but then you then you realize you talk to racists or you see racism in your everyday life, and you're like, wow, racism's really entrenched. Yeah, and it's really ingrained. And uh, is it just because people are so used to we're animals, like we just judge yeah. based on our eyes, and then we fill in the blanks, like that's hard to change that human nature, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, racism is psychological. It's definitely something that starts off as a thought, turns into a bias, turns into a stereotype, then you begin to enact out all of those biases all of those stereotypes in a multitude of ways. I, I always try to remind people that racism isn't always explicit violence. It's not always explicit through a racial slur. Uh, racism actually on a day to day is very implicit, meaning it's, it's very subtle. Um, it's very easy to gaslight. It's very easy to dismiss. Um, I'm actually working on a piece right now on media bias and how it's actually coming into play with um, even like tragedies, like very tragic events. Um, and in my research, what I'm finding is that it's very easy to say, oh, well, this isn't racism because of this, or this can't be racist because of that. Um, and the, the reason a lot of people try to dismiss racism as an actual problem is because people's own egos start to get in the way. Then they have to actively look at themselves and say, well, have I ever done that to anybody? And then it becomes a conundrum within you know, the person's psyche where they actively have to admit that there is a problem and that they perhaps have played a role in that problem, which is why anti-racism tends to be um, very dismissed and uh, easily demonized is because a lot of the opposition likes to say, for instance, with critical race theory, which is actually more so uh, in law schools and things like that and more higher academia. Um, but for instance, with critical race theory, we have seen it be demonized heavily by the opposition, not just white people, but also people of color have demonized it as this thing where, you know, white people are the problem, white people are evil, et cetera. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that, but I do think that it, it's imperative to see why it's being so heavily demonized and, and why there's so much misinformation around it. Because I think a lot of people end up projecting their own insecurities um, when they are opposing something that is actually really, really needed in society. We need to be investigating racism, prejudice, uh, sexism, colorism, all of these things need to be investigated if we are truly going to be a liberated society. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where people don't take a look at the psychology behind it. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, white people are the, are evil, white people, I, you know, I read a lot of Malcolm X, right? white people that are the devil. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I actually don't agree with that, right? Like, because, um, you talk about a lot, a lot about decolonization, right? I'm like, it's hard to deep. My, my essence is colonized, right? <laughs> like yeah. I am black, I am Taino, I am Lenka, I am white, right? My, my grandfather on my mom's side was Croatian. And then I have English on, on uh, my mom's side too. And, and my, my Puerto Rican grandma was probably Corsican. She looked exactly like Lucille Ball. And so like, mm -hmm. I grew up, around with racism, like I've been called the N word, I've been called a porch monkey, I've been called all kinds of things. But like, my whole idea as a history nerd, I, I graduated with a degree in history. You know, we're not supposed to do this in history, counterfactuals, well, what if this had happened, mm -hmm. other than what had happened, right? I mean, what if, you know, I read about as, as, as a Honduran, I read about, you know, we're not, we're, we don't glorify the Aztecs, because the Aztecs, butchered my ancestors right mm -hmm. and so like 
just as a counterfactual, I'm not trying to here to make some statement or whatever, but it's just a okay. way of it's a thought experiment of like, what if, what if the Aztecs had gunpowder, right? It's really that Europe had gunpowder, it stole it from China. And with gunpowder, you know, uh, they, they sought to conquer Europe and then the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, what if Aztecs had gunpowder? What if, you know, like, is it is it something about white people that you know their neanderthal gene or whatever they say you know <laughs> that they they're just more brutish that they're just whatever i don't think that because i have white i can't think that because i have white blood right and mm. um so this I, is where it becomes personal for you right? right this is where the ego starts to get in the way where you may perhaps not want to investigate that because you may have too much proximity to whiteness mm. right and that is a conundrum for a lot of people particularly people in the caribbean where integration has been such a huge part of our culture right we're all we all became integrated after the spaniards came in because they didn't have the same ideology of segregation as the british did so right. integration was actually meant to erase blackness or proximity to blackness within our society so there's a lot of racial mixing within the caribbean and so it's a very natural tendency for people of color in particular to say, well, I don't wanna um, you know, presume that white people in general are, you know, are the problem or they um, have devilish tendencies or anything like that um, because we do have so, such close proximity to that. You know, I have all sorts of ancestors. I have Spanish ancestors, Taino ancestors, African ancestors. So, you know, it when I, began doing my anti-racist journey and my own decolonial theory education, I really had to take a hard look at how am I going to engage in this work, knowing that I have all these, you know, different multicultural facets of myself and even within my culture. When I go to Puerto Rico, it's very racially mixed, right? Yeah. It's very racially integrated. However, there are still pockets where anti-Blackness shows up, particularly sure. in the city right, San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, even Luquillo, where my mom is from, which is very country-like. Um, and the Guanabichos, right, where they call them? Yeah. Yeah, well, for instance, in um, places like uh, Loisa, Puerto Rico, where it's a predominantly Black town, you see pockets of how anti-Blackness actually comes into play within society, again, very subtly, but it is still there. And so you can see the legacy of the Spaniards, of the colonizers still playing out today, but because people don't want to investigate it or they stop themselves from investigating it, um, people don't really try to go further. But to kind of come back to you and what you're saying, I'm not saying that, you know, in my decolonial theory, I don't tell people that white people are the devil, right? Like I don't go to the dehumanized, <laughs> to the dehumanization <laughs> part, right? However, I do agree that whiteness affords white people the ability to do really evil things. Whiteness is power, um, right? That, that my whole thing is, is that about power. you give anybody power and they're going to do foul shit, right? You give mm -hmm. a priest power, he does foul shit. Uh, parents do foul shit to their children, right? The government does foul shit to yeah. the public. And so whiteness right. is power. That's ugly, right? And white, and white people impose that. That's the ugliness of yeah. it. But like Lupe Fiasco, yeah, I'm from Chicago. Lupe Fiasco has a, yeah. has a beautiful song called All Black Everything. Yeah. And uh, so the, the counterfactual is what if black people were in charge? What if brown people were in charge? Would there not be racism? I mean, I my contention is that power corrupts no matter who you are. There's nothing about a brown person or a black person that makes them above ugliness. Right. And that's where decolonial theory comes in. That's why we need anti-racism to be a part of decolonial theory. So you mentioned, you know, about the Aztecs. What if they actually were the ones to, to have weapons and they went across, you know, the Americas and across the ocean over to maybe even Africa or Asia or anything like that? Um, and they are were the ones that we would see in power. Um, I think what's important to note is that every society has been colonized in one way or another by a multitude of people, right? If you take a look at the continent of Asia, the Chinese tried to conquer the Japanese, the Japanese tried to conquer Korea. You know, there's a lot of that. There's a lot or even of England. England, you know, the first mm -hmm. they were Celtic and then the the Normans and then the Vikings. I mean, the, right. England's a 
you know, totally. It's almost like Latin America yeah. in a way. It's like the Latin America of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every continent has had its history with colonization. So colonization is not specific to white supremacy. So I always like to tell this in one of my courses, um, dismantling colonial mentality. It's colonization or the um, process of colonization is not specific to white supremacy or whiteness. However, in the last 500 years, that's who has enacted the power, that's who has enacted violence onto other people by way of race, which is not founded on any, you know, facts or right. science at all, but yeah. that's how they have portrayed it to be. So actually the ideology of whiteness started with European white folks against other European white folks who they did not want to deem as white. So that was Jewish folks were not deemed as white back in the day, along with two other racialized groups who I'm forgetting right now. Um, but it was actually enacted against each other. So yeah. you could have a cousin that was Jewish, but because you are um, you know, considered a white European, you will actually be fighting against your own cousin racially because of that mentality. Um, and because they did hold the power and they were you know, perhaps more advanced with weapons, um, that colonial mentality began to sink, sink in. And so not only were they colonizing other parts of Europe, but then they decided to colonize the continent of Africa. And then the Spanish decided to colonize um, the Caribbean. Right. And then the British decided to colonize the Americas. So, you know, the French, we can't forget about the French or the Dutch. So all of these things come into play and that's when it becomes uh, supremacist behavior. Yeah. So what was the difference between, for instance, in the continent of Asia, Asians um, fighting against each other and colonizing each other back and forth because it happened quite often. Um, what's the difference between that level of colonization versus the global colonization of white supremacy, which we actually see in modern day, it's actually much more violent and much more prevalent. So what I hope that people start to learn about decolonial theory is that we're not saying that we want to, um, for instance, replace one race with another. So one supremacist power with another supremacist power. Decolonization is about dismantling the colonial mentality that people have um, that is actually a replication of white supremacist theology. In order for all of us to start to dismantle that, we have to start taking a look at race. And if we don't dismantle race as a myth and as a lie, essentially, then we're just going to continue perpetuating that. And so it is very possible that one supremacist power can overtake a marginalized or oppressed community, and then they will in turn enact the same white supremacy, but this time it might be black supremacy or, or brown supremacy or indigenous supremacy. Um, it's just in a different face and body. Um, so decolonization is actually really imperative if we want to live in a liberated society. And also, you know, you're talking to a Marxist. I'm not saying I'm a socialist, but I, yeah. you know, I see the world through a Marxist lens of like, you know, the ha the, the classes, right? People yeah. who, who do the work and the people who benefit off of it. And, um, you know, uh, co colonialism really, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be capitalism without colonialism, without racism, right? right. Uh, they needed, the, the white uh, European power needed a class of people to, to exploit and a reason to exploit them. We're exploiting these black and brown people because they're black and brown, they're not Christian or whatever, they're black, they're, they're less than, they're, they're inferior. And if you get, a, get rid of race, which itself is, <laughs> how long is that going to take, right? Yeah. We're still going to have classes of, of one way or another, right? I For mean, sure. If everybody's the same color, which we're hopefully, I think we're going towards there, right? One day everybody will be the same color because we're all mixing <laughs> slowly. You're, I know you're in a, in a, in a biracial uh, marriage. I am too. My, my wife is white, Mexican, and I'm, you know, negrito, moreno, <laughs> whatever, trieño, um, all the same thing. Um, but... Um, and you, you know, I'm sure you, you, the way people look at you still, right? Mm -hmm. Still, or like even woke people, like, oh, it's so cool that you guys are multiracial. Like, you know, it's, it's weird, you know, like that it's you're thinking strange. about it. Yeah, it's a very strange uh, reality. And I actually disagree. I don't think that we're going to end up being a monolithic race. I, I think historically that has been proven to um, not <laughs> be the case. I actually think that multiple races, as far as we know race to be today based on phenotype, 
um, will continue. I think there's always going to be black folks, there's always going to be brown folks and people in the middle, and there's always going to be white folks. I think what's important is not to just embrace um, multicultural identity or biracial identity, um, but it's also to learn how to decolonize our idea around race. Race before whiteness, before European colonization even, uh, was strictly about you, you know where you lived, what type of village you lived in, the the area. The people over um, there, yeah, right. Yeah, so um, essentially, what we know of as ethnicity today, that used to be what race was essentially. And but because you could also be adopted into a society, because some folks were, um, for instance, exiled from their community for whatever reason. Uh, whether they were just different, um, whether they didn't subscribe to the norms of that village or that town, um, then they were exiled and you could actually be adopted into a new village or a new tribe and then that became your race. So it had nothing to do with phenotype, with how somebody looks, the, the facial features or structure, um, that actually never came into play until whiteness was created. So I, I think if we're going to live in a decolonized world, uh, race is not actually going to be in the picture at all, even though we are visibly going to be able to see differences in each other because of globalization. It's going to look very different to what it looked like before globalization because people are migrating now, right? Like they're moving from one place to another. Um, you know, American people are moving to Asia. Um, Asians are moving to South America. Like there's obviously going to be differences in people and how they look. But in a decolonial world, I actually don't think that um, we're going to become monolithic in any way. I think we're just going to learn how to embrace each other for those differences rather than because of those differences. Yeah, I mean, I just I thought about it, like, again, to go to the Marxist thing, like to, the, the idea to there is get rid of the classes, class, to create a classless society by getting rid of money, because money is currency, right? Mm -hmm. To get rid of a, a a ra to be anti-racist -ra is to get rid of whiteness in the same way that to be Marxist is to get rid of money and class, right? Because mm -hmm. what you're saying is whiteness is currency, right? I mean, and the mm -hmm. whiter you are, the more money you got in the bank, you know. It, right, the, it's social currency. Right. Yeah, it's social currency. So even if it's not money related, right, even if it's not going to make you a billionaire, um, it'll certainly get you in as a CEO or it's gonna get you um, to get a pass with the police, right? It's, it's very much a social currency that people have. It's a privilege, um, it's an unearned right. And, um, and you know, very similar to classism, which we do talk about in decolonial theory, I don't think it's just taking away money that's going to create um, an equal social class. I think more right. so, because I am currently studying Marxism as well, um, I think more so it's about how we place value onto something. So whiteness in the current moment is more valuable than blackness, for instance. That's gonna get you a job more than likely. It's gonna get you a house more than likely. It's gonna get you a bank loan. It's gonna get you a ride with the police, right? Um, it's gonna give you a lot of those social things that, um, you know, for instance, black folks or people on the, the spectrum of brownness and between the binary are gonna get. Um, and when we take a look at classism, it's not just about money. It's the, it's the power that comes with money and how that can be abused and manipulated. And so we place value on money, but it's right. not really the money that's right. the issue. The issue is the power that comes with that value. And so the moment that we decide as a society, where, whether it's with race or class or gender, the money the the moment that we decide as a society to stop placing more value on one thing over another that's when we can really start to see change but that's really hard for people especially yeah. the people who have the power right you don't <laughs> want to give it up seen. you don't exactly. want to give it up it's like it's, it's it's like in the bible i'm not you know i'm an atheist but in the bible yeah. it says people think that it says the love of money or that money is the root of all evil it's not what it says it says the love of money is the root of right. all evil and so white you know whiteness is not in itself the root of all evil the love of whiteness or the yeah. premium the value that we place on whiteness is the root of the evil of racism right exactly yeah and that's 
that's the value that we see placed on gender as well. Right. Um, looking at men as the more powerful, the more um, the more deemed with value that you are seen through masculinity, for example, um, that creates a whole host of other issues, right? It yeah. creates sexism, misogyny, misogynoir, uh, which is very specific to Black women and what they experience. Um, so, you know, placing a, a higher value onto something or someone over another is always going to create issues no matter what. So decolonization is more so about taking a look at how can we create equity across all lines? So bringing the oppressed up and um, almost finding an equilibrium with everything rather than necessarily overthrowing, right? A lot of people think that abolition is about overthrowing something, throwing it in the garbage and not replacing it with anything new. I think abolition is more so about taking a look at the parts that don't work and replacing them with parts that do work. Um, and that's kind of what I think we need to do with race um, and also class and also gender. I think we need to look at these for what they are, which are strictly social constructs. And the moment that we see them for what they actually are, not what they um, are enacted as, then we can really start dismantling some stuff and seeing how we can become a more holistic society. Uh, it's, it's funny that, and you brought up the gender thing, and I, and I don't want people to think who are listening and watching this that I'm sucking up to, uh, you know, a wolf woman here. <laughs> um, but uh, I always thought, it was, I, I think patriarchy and misogyny is weird. Obviously, I benefit from it. And, and I, I have my own, you know, just like you have to decolonize, you have to demisogynize yourself as a man, which is very yeah. hard to do because I'm in power, right? Um, but it's so weird. I think if you look by bi biologically, it seems pretty obvious that men are just supposed to be a support system for women that women, women create life, women are amazing. Like I was saying like Latinos are kick, kicking ass like they're, <laughs> uh, uh, they're, they're graduating from college more than anybody. They're doing all this stuff like the, Latinos are taking over the world. And I'm, I'm saying like, Latinos have been like that the whole time for centuries. And it's just now that with these social advancements that they're able to compete uh, more, you know, still not equal. They, they're still, you know, the, the Latina equal uh, the pay gap and everything like that. But mm -hmm. now that they're able to compete, I mean, it's no contest with a woman, you know, between a, a man and a woman, because women are just, I've been married for almost 10 years. And the way my wife operates is I is on a whole nother level, right? I, I have a yeah. one track mind. I, I you know, I'm, and she can juggle all these things. And, and uh, I live in Nevada and we have two female senators and uh, all the women control government. And I wrote this thing that, yeah, I think, I think women should be in charge. And I think women are supposed to be in charge. And I think the only, I don't know how that happened, but mm. um, there's a theory that men are, you know, there's a theory that men are afraid of women, right? That mm -hmm. a woman creates life. Like, mm -hmm. so like back in the day when they didn't know about, they didn't know about uh, how, pregnancy worked, you know, you, the, a man and a woman had sex, her belly grew inexplicably, and then a, another human being came out. Right. That And that scares the shit out of uh, primitive man, right? Because that's mm -hmm. magic. That is magic, right? And so we have to control this thing. It's like fire, right? Now that we have fire, we have to control it. Who has the fire? And who yeah. controls women? But it seems obvious to me that we're just, men are just, you know, we're strong, and that's pretty much it. We make, we make <laughs> rash decisions based on our testosterone. It has test, been shown that testosterone in your system makes you make brash decisions like really quickly. Women are more contemplative, in touch mm -hmm. with their feelings, able to express their feelings. But maybe that's just practice too, right? We're raised in a society where men aren't, don't get to practice that. Yeah, I mean, I think if you take a look at the evolution of hum Homo sapiens, which is human beings who survived, right, there, there used to be six different types of humans. Um, Homo sapiens are the only ones who have survived out of the six. And so if you take a look at the history of Homo sapiens, they used to be a matriarchal society. So uh, with exceptions, um, for the most part, it was the women who were strategizing. It was the women who were um, figuring out the food situation. It was the men who were gathering that food, right? The hunter gatherer, you know, ideology. Um, and that is true that, you know, they would utilize the skill of strength of uh, having testosterone in their body to be able to um, carry more weight and be a slightly more power, 
powerful. Well, they physically. say like because like because since men had to go hunt and we're out in the dark and yada yada, we have to when we hear a noise, we have to respond violently, right? And so right. that's they say that that's what that's where that comes from and where where women necessarily don't have that testosterone doesn't do it. Women don't have a lot of testosterone compared to men and testosterone makes for brash decisions. And that's where that comes from. Yeah, I don't know too much the science about that. But what I do know is that in a matriarchal society, you didn't necessarily have the supremacist power play that patriarchy right. does. Right. So that would be the major difference there, um, because strategically, it doesn't make sense to have a supremacist power. Right. And so because women were making a lot of the decisions, if not all of the decisions, they were also also um, particular to you and me being by, you know, descendants. Um, it was the women who actually right. kept historical records and they taught history. They taught language. They taught um, you know, art, they taught all sorts of things, right? So really it was the women who were upholding society and the men were supporting that society. So I don't necessarily think that men are meant to support women. I think everyone is meant to support community and the way in which we go about that um, really should not be held based on the construct of gender, but it should be based on what do you like to do? What are you skilled at? And then you go do that. So for instance, um, you know, back in the day, it wasn't just men who played sports. For instance, again, Tainos, it wasn't just the men who played football. Um, it was actually a mix of people, right? It was children, whether they were male or female. Um, it was two-spirit people, um, non-binary folks or trans folks. Um, everyone was playing sports. It wasn't segregated like you see now. And it also, one wasn't upheld to a higher standard than another. It was all about skill. Who has the skill to do this thing so that we can enact that thing, right? Right. And it was the same with, you know, growing food, gathering food, um, but mostly it was the women strategizing, keeping the society together, keeping the community together. They were also, you know, um, the, the spiritual keepers. So, yes, there were men who were caciques, but for the most part, it was women who were caciques. Well, so, like in the, it wasn't it in the Native American tradition, like there was a, ma a male chief, but it was yeah. elected by the women, right? Yeah, it was elected by the society. It was elected by the community. So it was all based on how well can you uphold these spiritual practices or how well can you strategize to keep our community alive? Because yes, it was all about survival back then. It wasn't about, can I afford this iPhone? It was, you know, are we going to survive the winter, for example? Um, so yeah, it was, it was all based on not constructs it was based on what can you provide to the community that's going to be beneficial for everybody yeah and i think that's where people say oh you know uh men are feel lost but it's because we're taking down the patriarchy that you know <laughs> was like a, a the the guidebook for for men for so long that now we're like no just be like a normal person you know loving understanding and support community and then most people are most men are like what, what does that what does that mean what do i do yeah, what's, and that's, again, that's the psychology of it, right? The ego starts to get in the way and you have to all of a sudden examine, well, what's my part? What's my role? If I'm no longer, you know, the patriarch of the family, if I'm feeling emasculated by, you know, my wife or my partner earning more money than I am, then where does, where does that put me? And that is the unfortunate side of, you know, needing to dismantle patriarchy or any sort of social construct that is supremacist um, because it it builds up an entire identity around that person. So if all you know and all you are is the concept of a man, when that begins to um, start getting dismantled, right? Similar with race, if all you know and your entire identity is built up around whiteness and that starts to get stripped away or deconstructed, who are you? you have to examine that for yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's really hard for people to do, especially if they're the ones in power. That's so funny that I, you know, before just in the morning, I was like, oh yeah, I'm not gonna talk too much about her, about uh, decolonization and all this stuff. Cause I, and I, it's over <laughs> my head, but like, it's so interesting and it's so important to have these conversations, right? Yeah. And uh, I have questions, so who better to ask than you, right? Um, I just yeah. saw before I got in here, I saw a headline like, 
we need to decolonize space exploration because you're talking about colonizing the moon, colonizing yeah. Mars. And people are like, no, no, we don't have to colonize anything out in space. Right. Right. So imagine, right? Like I, okay. So I love alien movies. I actually do. I love alien movies. I'm an hour away from Area 51. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the concept of aliens and what they might look like. Do you, how they do, might act. do you think they exist? I actually do think other civilizations exist. I don't think we're ever going to meet them. <laughs> so, so what are these, what are these UFOs? What are these visitations? Or are they it might be them, right? It might very well be them. I don't know. I think that um, I don't think that us as a civilization right now on Earth are ready to meet aliens with our current mentality. Yeah. I think that other civilizations definitely exist, and I do believe that it is very possible they have much higher and much more advanced technology than we could ever imagine. Right. Um, but I don't think it would be a good idea for them to come right now because I think exactly what happens in the movies and how movies are scripted um, is exactly what's going to happen, right? The people in power, meaning the government, is going to try and apprehend whoever comes in and they're going to violently, you know, exterminate them or banish them, right? I think there is a huge fear, and this is very evident in Hollywood, there's a huge fear about the unknown. And what are they going to do to us? What do they want? Why are they here? And all of that is actually very historical to how human beings have actually acted, right? Right. Um, I, I've been reading a lot about uh, Taino history, and I've been thinking a lot about, well, what were they thinking about the Spaniards? Because the Spaniards came in and looked drastically different than the Tainos. They didn't wear the same stuff. They didn't speak the same language. Um, they didn't sing the same songs. They didn't even have the same mentality. So, you know, what was it like for them to encounter this like new species and, and figure that out? And the way that it's portrayed in the books and the history books is that they were very docile, um, that they were very welcoming, that they didn't actually have, you know, enact any violence against the Spaniards. And I'm actually seeing evidence that that is not true. That I heard they like actually, Jamaica, right? When they went to Jamaica, yeah. they were like, no, don't even step foot on this shore. Don't even step foot here, right? Because there's an inherent um, will of human beings to survive the unknown, to survive a possible threat. And I do think that the way that Spaniards looked back then was very threatening. I think yeah. they did um, have guns on them all of the time. And even if the Tainos didn't exactly know what a gun was or what it looked like or what it could do, I think that was very threatening to them. And I think that our Taino ancestors were actually really resilient and they were very community based and they didn't want their community to, um, you know, face violence and extinction. So. I don't necessarily believe the history books. However, I bring this up to say that because of that history, because of the history of colonization and how that has played out within European colonization specifically, yeah. and now with Western imperialism kind of taking over, I think people are really, really scared of what a new, more powerful, more advanced civilization, what they could actually do to us, um, and that they would have the same colonial mentality that Europeans did through their colonization, um, I think people are really, really terrified that that could actually happen it's, to the powerful. It's karma, right? I mean, yeah. I think it was Bill Gates or, or no, it wasn't Bill Gates. It was my bad. Why, why would I? It was Stephen Hawking. It was not Bill Gates. <laughs> Stephen Hawking, before he died, he said, we better hope that there's not, there's probably is alien life because the universe is so big, just the odds of it, right? Yeah. Um, but we better hope that they never find us because they're he said they're going to do exactly what you're saying they're going to do exactly to us what the europeans did to the uh the 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 americas right there's this advanced it's like he said if you're walking down the sidewalk and you see a bug on the street you don't think anything of stepping on it you don't think anything of it because it's just so small to you and so if they're so advanced they're going to pass by this little rock with these little things crawling over it us and just smash it. Um, and, but the other, you know, we should hope that in the, if they're so advanced, they're also advanced, not only technologically, but also mentally, spiritually, so that they're like, you know what, these little puny little life forms, they also have value. Let's treat them with respect. That's the hope, right? Yeah, I think it says a lot more about us and right. how we think. 
and how much we're projecting onto a civilization that we have no idea if they exist, they don't exist, what they are doing, why they would even come to, you know, our solar system. Um, it, it definitely says a lot more about us than it does about them. I would love to see, uh, talking about the Tainos, and maybe there has been one, but like a really good, like, I'm talking about like Lee Daniels or, or Lee Daniels made the 12 Years a Slave, right? Or no, no, it was, um, I'm not what's sure. his name? No, it wasn't Lee Daniels. It was, uh, <laughs> uh, what's his name? McQueen, um, right? It was McQueen. Uh, do like a Taino version of that because I would love to see the, the, the that scene where they drown Salcedo in the river. Oh man, because that must have been that must have been some real ass shit. Like, hey, come with us. We're gonna go get some water, and then they go to drown him. Um, I mean, what what is the the myth is that they drowned him to see if they're if these people were immortal? But is maybe it was just an act of resistance, right? Yeah, I, I think it was an act of resistance. I think that they saw the threat and they responded to the threat. Um, I think that, you know, the people who wrote our history books were obviously Spanish, <laughs> to be quite frank with you, and then the British, and then, you know, Americans. And so I think it's very obvious that they projected a lot of their own mythology and a lot of their own projections onto um, how history is uh, currently taught. I think we see that in um, not just the Caribbean, but also in the United States. Um, and abroad too. I, I remember, and I've told the story multiple times, is I was raised in Puerto Rico. And so- What part? Uh, I was uh, raised in Bayamon. So I remember being taught about natives and indigenous people and the Tainos. And I remember how those stories, even, even as flawed as they were, were drastically different than what I was learning about the indigenous Native Americans of the US. It was so stark for me that I realized that, you know, there's so much bias in even just education, um, in academia, in the way in which we tell stories that, you know, it is true. There's an African proverb that says, um, you know, the, the lion will always be the hero as long as he's the one telling the story. And that is very true for the Taino people. It's very true for all of the Caribbean. Um, it's true for the indigenous peoples of the United States, of Central and South America. Um, we have seen it over time how stories have been manipulated and twisted to fit the narrative of the more powerful and you know the su supremacist power. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's 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 crazy that i mean it's decolonization we should probably talk about our native puerto rico right yeah. um the the problem there is that it's gentrification right colonization is almost it's gentrification is colonization right it's just it's just yes homegrown right but there, so now it's yeah. reaching puerto rico i mean what is tell us a bit about you you just you were just there you were talking about uh, somebody trying to buy your house you know and and, and your mom's house and uh, tell us quickly like about that situation and what can somebody like me in the diaspora do to help? I, I wasn't raised there, I wasn't born there, but I do feel a need to, to um, you know, uh, do what I can, right? Yeah, so the situation has been happening actually for a long time, for the last 123 years since it has been colonized by the US. Um, so that level of gentrification actually stems from Spanish colonization um, of the island. So if you have ever been through San Juan, Puerto Rico, you will see that there is Spanish colonial architecture all over the place. It's basically the entire town is colonial architecture, and it has been upheld even after 400 years of colonization. Um, people cherish it. Like they go above and beyond to preserve that architecture. Even there's a, um, there's a cemetery uh, specifically holding the, um, you know, dead bodies of Spanish colonizers and it is gated. It looks beautiful. It has angels everywhere. Um, you're not going to see that for the Taino people. Um, Taino people died in San Juan in mass. And you're not going to ever see anything commemorating their deaths um, and their resilience, right? You're only the only place that I found that actually was um, kind of commemorating that culture uh, pretty explicitly was in Utuado, which is where there's the most evidence of Taino um, civilization there. Um, so 
you know, what I started witnessing since I could actually process what gentrification actually was in my teens, um, it has gotten drastically worse within the last five years. So when I was a teenager, you know, visiting Puerto Rico often, um, I knew that there were certain parts of the island that I was just automatically going to run into a lot of tourists, a lot of gringos, um, but I didn't necessarily see them moving in until I started hitting college. And then I started seeing a lot of gringos just, you know, living there. But after Hurricane Maria, it actually became 10 times worse. So the last time I had visited, um, I just went to visit in October. The last time I was on the island was right before Maria hit. There was already a mass exodus um, in, from Puerto Rico natives coming to the United States. Uh, that actually started back in the 60s and the 70s. But um, after Maria, I think that number actually tripled if we're going to look at statistics. And now the island looks drastically different, even just within the last five years. There's so many Americans and Europeans moving into um, particularly the cities, but also in the countryside. They're buying up land like crazy. Um, and they're enacting and imposing their own Western imperialist views, right? Like there's a lot of McDonald's, there's a lot of franchises, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, all of that is already happening or it had already happened, um, you know, even when I was a teenager. But now you're also seeing things like, um, you know, little coffee shops that are owned by Americans and Europeans that are bringing in things like matcha with which, you know, for Puerto Ricans like that's we would never even think about that right <laughs> it's just not part of our culture um and by the way I drink a lot of matcha but <laughs> I never I mean I try you know it's when it's good it's good but most of it's like I just a weird right. flavor maybe it's like it's, culturally my palate is not used to that exactly right? exactly it's not something that a Boricua would ever be like yeah let me get that matcha real quick right um you know we're still very much attempting to hold on to our traditions and our culture even if it has colonized or colonial components to that. And so I saw very viscerally a huge stark difference from just five years ago to now. Um, the population has dropped in half in, in the span of five years. Um, and the American and European population has risen, I would say, probably tripled um, since then. So it's it's definitely a huge, huge problem. Has been for a while, but within the last five years, it's just gotten so much worse. I mean, and, and what 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 do people like me do? I mean, I mean, I I, I see that they're, they're trying to buy up land, try to buy up property and stuff like that. I mean, I'm thinking like we need to like have some kind of fund some kind of real estate fund or something where all the Boricuas around the world, around the world, uh, just donate and somebody manages this and, and buys land for us because we can't physically yeah. be there. They're there. They're down there, right? They're they're already scoping out territories and, and properties. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's um, so just within the real estate industry in general, it's no longer just um, individual real estate people that are real estate investors that are buying up land. Now it's entire companies that have grown from one individual into an entire agency that are coming in and buying up the land in Puerto Rico. And a lot of that has to do with environmental racism, as we've seen with climate change um, and the way in which the United States has not helped out um, its own citizens. You know, they give us citizenship, but they don't treat us like citizens. And so because of that, people see dollar signs. They see empty buildings, which there are a lot of empty buildings, a lot of um, empty lots, a lot of empty houses. They see that and they see dollar signs. They see an island that looks like paradise and they see these empty homes and buildings and they naturally wanna buy it up and you know sell it to the highest bidder. So that had already been happening, but now it's happening 10 times worse than before. Um, so, you know, one of the projects that I am currently working on is um, around, you know, what allies, but also um, Boricuas in the diaspora can do to help the people who have actually stayed on the island, not only keep their homes and businesses, but to also rematriate the island. Um, one of the main reasons uh, why I have not been able to move back to Puerto Rico as much as I have tried is because I don't have the money to buy up a house that 
you know, a real estate investor is, you know, purchasing at $50,000 and selling. For you, right? yeah. yeah, they outbid you immediately. Um, and, you know, when you buy up a property, let's say you do find one that's worth $40,000, for example, um, it's still going to take a lot of work to fix that house because there's a lot of damage from Hurricane Maria. There are still people uh, living under blue tarps right. um, after Hurricane Maria, and that happened five years ago. So there's a lot that needs to get fixed architecturally, um, but also the government. The government does nothing to help even native Boricuas, let alone the rematriation of the island from diaspora. So um, the government, we need much better leadership. And one of the best ways that we can do that is to support local politicians who natives want to see um, being put in positions of power to be able to change the, the outcome. There's a, a big independence movement that has been growing for a really long time um, that we can also support from the diaspora, but also just allies who want to help. Um, another thing is education. I think it's really important that um, Americans in particular learn about the colonial history of Puerto Rico um, and learn that uh, Boricuas are colonized people and you contribute to that colonization yeah. um, because you support the government, right? You, your taxes are paying for the colonization of my people. My taxes, because I live in Los Angeles, are paying for the colonization of my, my own people. So it's important to understand the politics of it, but also the history of it as well. Um, another idea that I've had is very similar to what you were speaking of uh, land trust. So there has been examples um, of very successful land trusts, particularly in Oakland, California, where uh, indigenous peoples from Northern California have created a land trust in order to buy up homes and give them back to native and indigenous people. I think that's a really fantastic idea and we've seen the success of it. And I think if we can do that in a really big way or even just have multiple different people and communities creating land trusts around the island, I think that's going to be a really great way of rematriating. But even if you buy up a home, you're not necessarily going to find work because the government yeah. has been so corrupt that jobs are, you know, almost non-existent over there. You're not going to be able to find one. So, you know, when I was on the island recently, I spoke to my Uber driver and he was telling me, you know, I used to work at such and such place and I can't do that anymore. Now I have to do Uber, which is more flexible, but it pays less because I can't find a job. And so you're going to be hard pressed to be able to make a living to pay for this new house that you just got, right? Because you're still going to have to pay a mortgage. Um, and that's one of the bigger reasons why people don't move back. It's one of the re major reasons my parents had to move out of the island was because of the lack of um, job opportunities there. So um, providing good leadership, but also providing different ways of earning income, whether that's, you know, working from home, which we are all pretty much able to do now, you just need a laptop and um, a virtual job, and you'll be able to earn, you know, money that way. Um, but also creating businesses, I think there needs to be an incentive for the diaspora to come back and build businesses on the island. Um, and that will be, you know, native owned, it'll be local, and it'll support the community, and it'll create jobs in that community. So there are ways to make and fix this um, issue and make it much more bearable for people and, and have people actually thrive. But if we don't have the ability or create the access to be able to do that, then it's not gonna happen. So it really is gonna take all the allies we can find and all of the diaspora to, to make something like that happen. And then like, you know, the, the fact that Puerto Rico's economy is, is the way it is by design, by colonialism. Like yeah. they're not gonna colonize a place and have it ha have a booming economy where everybody can get a nice job because that's power, right? Money is mm -hmm. power. So they don't want people making, they don't want the people from there making a lot of money. Uh, they want right. the people who come in making a lot of money. Exactly. And, uh, and then you have a white supremacist uh, imperial government controlling it. So uh, that's not, that doesn't spell, you know, that spells disaster for, for the people of Puerto Rico, unless we uh, in the diaspora, but also our allies, because it's only 7 million Puerto Ricans worldwide or something like that. So yeah. we need all the help we can get. 
Yeah, there's about um, 7 million in the diaspora and about 3 million on the island. So you can see that there's, you know, that there's a reason for that. You can see that there was a huge mass exodus to leave the island because of a lack of job opportunity and government corruption. And I think, you know, the lack of really solid leadership on the island has been detrimental. Currently, the leader, um, the governor is a state hooder. <laughs> so he's not going to help the independence case at all. He's not working towards decolonizing the island at all. Um, but also shipping regulations from U.S. imperialism yeah. uh, against the island, that doesn't help either. So there's a multitude of things that needs to be tackled. And I think, honestly, Boricos are really exhausted. Um, this isn't a problem we created, and yet we still have to endure and fight against. And it becomes uh, really difficult to tell, you know, Boricua, well, you just have to stay on the island and just fight it out, right? That becomes exhausting, especially if you have yeah. children or you want to have children and you want to raise them in a place that is thriving and not struggling. Right. So um, I, I think it, that, you know, it's going to take a really long time to get all of these issues fixed, particularly if the U.S. decides to stay and, you know, keep us as a colony um, and, you know, not a state or not give us independence. But I also think that it's imperative people understand that if they are fighting for statehood, what that's actually going to mean. Because if you take a look at Hawaii, that um, they were actually stolen. They it, nobody voted for that to happen. They yeah. did not want to become a state. However, they have become a state, and the native indigenous population of Hawaii has been fighting against U.S. imperialism for a really long time, and that has not helped anything on the actual island. There's even more gentrification than before. Now you have white people claiming to be native Native Hawaiians, yeah. um, which is really disrespectful. Was right? that, that that George Clooney movie, right? The generation. Yeah. Was called. <laughs> exactly. It's so disrespectful, and it's erasure. It's outright erasure. So um, the same thing that happened to Hawaii is more more than likely to happen in Puerto Rico. Um, so I am always going to be a proponent of independence, even though that is also has its own challenges as well. Um, but, you know, I think the diaspora is tired. Um, they just want to survive just like everybody else, myself included. But I do think that there are very real ways in which we can help. And I'm one of the people that's trying to show how you can do that from afar. But also, if you want to rematriate, how you can do that in, in a way that's actually accessible and feasible. So, you know, stay tuned. I might I might stay be tuned. back there in a, in a couple of years. Who knows? I mean, it's what a, what a conversation. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. It just it just reminds everybody and me that, you know, how tiring it is to be, uh, especially a woman, a woman of color, a Puerto Rican. Like you're just <laughs> it's tiring to fight against all those layers of oppression. But uh, thank you for fighting the good fight. and and, and and teaching us, the you know, the rest of us, uh, what we need to know to to be allies and to help free ourselves as well. Um, let everybody know where they can find you on social media and inter internet and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so currently, I'm uh, fighting with Zuckerberg on Instagram. <laughs> So, you know, catch me on Instagram until I decide to leave and, and completely take over a different platform. But yes, you can find me on Instagram at eliana.chinea. And uh, you can also go to embodyinclusivity.com slash linktree. And that will get you to um, my other two platforms on Patreon and my own app called the Anti-Oppression Social Club. Um, and you can basically support me on TikTok. I'm back on TikTok, uh, say under the same name as Instagram. And uh, I'm also uh, going to restart my YouTube channel pretty soon under the same name. So, yeah. And media, we all got to hustle, right? It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And we're going to be seeing, we're going to be talking a lot more with each other. Uh, yes. Big news coming there. But uh, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the Saturday. Thank you for taking time to talk to me, man. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Peace. Thank you.